Welcome to this first Sunday in the month of February. Thank God for the topic he has given us, the abundant life and the way he has been teaching us. Thank God for the Bible study so far, successfully going through January, going through book of Matthew in January. and We are in the book of Mark now, and we're looking forward to the discussion that the brethren will be bringing from the study. So to God be all glory for keeping every one of us alive. God has done well. God has done us well. And we return all praise, all glory to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Right away, we are going to go into the discussion. And wow, we have four discussants. Uh, seven minutes times four. That's already more than our time. But we'll see how we manage that because we must take this discussion to get today. Um, so um, we will start with Brother Dara. His discussion is on what Jesus has said to us that we should do from the book of Matthew and, the, and Mark. What has Jesus said to us? What has he done that we should copy? And what has he said to us that we should do? So, Brother Dara, over to you. After Brother Dara, right away, um, uh, um, Sister Gloria, you get ready. And then Brother Sonny, and then Sister Comfort, you speak loud. Let's go. Hey, good morning. Uh, today, uh, the discussion is on Matthew. Matthew, as we have read the whole of Matthew and uh, Mark one to five as we have read thus far. Um, with the time given, I will just take on few things that Jesus commanded us and then share that we do. Jesus said quite a number of things from the start of that child, the uh, Bible reads, I think from the Sermon on the Mount, that's from chapter five. If you go through verses three to 11, verses 12, verses 13 to 16. The highlight is summarized in what we call the Beatitudes. And there, Jesus basically encouraged us on how to live, on how to go through pain, on how to, it was primarily an encouragement. I will just take one of those and then we'll move on from there. In verse, um, particularly verse 4, says that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, meaning that there is comfort for those who mourn. He also talks about, um, if you go to number verse 9, that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. An encouragement for everyone who um, lives by his word and then sues for peace. Praise God. From verse 19, um, of chapter five, the teaching there, the word, the big word there is that Jesus encourages that those who teach others the commands of God, God takes, Jesus takes it important, God takes it important, those who teach others the commandments of God. And um, you cannot teach if you have not lived, if you have not grown to become someone who lives by the standards of the cross, the standards of heaven, you won't be able to teach others. So, and God says there that anyone who teaches others to break these commands, he says that they will be considered as the least in his kingdom. Likewise, anyone who teaches others to keep the commandments of God, the teachings of God, the ways of the cross, he said those will be considered great. And one key thing that comes out of there is that if you want to be considered great in the kingdom, you should live by and teach others and encourage others to, you know, um, live by the standards of heaven. And that for me is a very strong point because I believe that each and every one of us, we want to be considered great. We want to be seen in, um, um, in the eyes of God as great or considered great of having been someone who lives in a way that can be seen as great. So the word there is that if, if we really want to fulfill that desire, we should live by the precept of the cross, what Jesus has said, and then not just accept that living by it, also teach others. 
bring others to it, share that understanding, make it known to others that they might abide us uh, uh, as well. Um, it goes further in chapter three, chapter six, uh, verse nineteen to twenty-one. Um, Jesus, there the, not, the wisdom there is uh, Jesus was talking about the the master and someone who was he was talking about wealth. And then he asked that we focus on the right thing, focusing on the right thing. What do I mean? He gave an example of um, someone who, let's just, let's just go there, Matthew chapter six. The key word there was that lay up treasures in heaven. So he said that they, from that scripture, we could pull out that the earth is a passing, you see, it's everything that stays on earth fades away. It rots, it breaks down, things coming, the steel, and all of those. But then how do we live? How do we conduct ourselves on earth in a way that makes sense to God, in a way that he approves? It is by focusing on the right thing. The right thing here is God. So for someone who wants to make wealth, you make wealth, but your focus is in God, such that the wealth doesn't possess your soul. It doesn't take you over. And for someone who doesn't have so much, if you focus on God, you also know that he is able, your trust, your trust is in him, he's able to meet your needs, he's able to solve your issues, he's able to pull you out of where you are and take you to, you know, some of the, the places that you desire, dream and believe in for. So that's the, the, the balance there. If you focus on him, he's able to meet our needs, solve our problems, you know, bring his fullness into our lives. That's for me, I think is a very powerful one. You know, it, it's, it's such a great balance. And if we go back, if you go further down that uh, uh, the next verse, I think chapter seven, chapter seven takes on this whole thing to a whole new level. But in other balance of people will call it a, a golden rule. Jesus gave us templates to live a successful life on earth. If the whole chapter, how we treat people, how we judge people, how we deal with people, how we relate. And it simplified it there that you give out to others the type of things you want to receive, the type of things you want to be given. So if you want peace, you treat others with, with peace, with love. If you desire love, you treat others with love. If you desire that people wouldn't judge you, you also do not judge others. I mean, so it's a give and receive. So what you give, you also receive. I also thought that was a powerful one that stood out for me in that particular um, I'm reading because it settles how we just relate beyond those in the household of faith, how we connect to others and live out our lives here on earth. Then um, the next key point was in um, Matthew 13. You know, when you go through the Matthew 13, Jesus Thank you, brother. So Dara, your time is up. So round off now with your okay. last point. Last point. Okay. Uh, the, the word that I want to pull out from there is a fit, a fertile heart is required for the word of God to grow. So if your heart is fertile, it will find expression, the word will grow, it will become bigger. So our responsibility is to make sure that our heart is you know fertile. Um, for that word to find expression so that we can live the abundant life of Christ here on earth, enjoy it, and also transcend to heaven. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Let me clap for you. God bless you. Okay, we'll just take the next speaker and then we'll come and if there are other references and things to add. Next, in the order I had asked us to do. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, from, from our study of the book of Matthew, there are some social issues that were listed out from the scriptures we've looked at. If we look at Matthew, well, let me just list a few of this, the issues because of time. Unforgiveness was stated there. Murder, anger, hatred, divorce, hypocrisy, disobedience, and all of that. Praise the Lord. But if we see that... Um, I want to focus on unforgiveness because Jesus, from what we saw in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 from verse 14 and 15, he talks about unforgiveness. A servant was um, 
I think I will just take all the scriptures together because of time. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, and then Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Talks about the parable of his servant also that was forgiven his debt by his master, forgiven so much debt, but he went away from there and saw his fellow servant that owed him so, um, a little and he couldn't forgive him, show him mercy the way he was showed mercy. And we also see that um, Jesus talks about if we take in our gift to the altar and we remember that we have fought against someone, we should drop that gift there and go and reconcile. So it, it, unforgiveness is very serious in the sight of God. And Jesus likened it also as for him that cannot forgive his brother or is angry with his brother, is guilty of murder. So for him to equate unforgiveness with murder, it's very serious in the sight of God. So we also see from, from the scriptures that we, we have mentioned that Peter was asking Jesus, which that how many times can he forgive his brother if he sins against him? Is this seven times? But Jesus told him 70 times, seven times. And if we look at that, that's a lot of times. Even the person won't be able to keep count of that anymore. So that tells us that we are to forgive without measure. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I just want us to hit on that lesson and look at it. If, or with all what is going on in the world today, we'll see that if there is love, if there is mercy, there will be no unforgiveness. And if Jesus could liken unforgiveness to murder and it, um, anger that leads to that, then if we can deal with this issue of unforgiveness, we won't have murders, we won't have divorces, we won't have disobedience. Because Jesus also made us to know, in, I can't remember which particular scripture now in Matthew, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So mm -hmm. if there is love, there will be obedience, there won't be divorce, there won't be hypocrisy. And there won't be unforgiveness. So I just want to encourage us to to so invite the let me, of the since, you, since you have a little time, so okay. I think we can take your time and discuss this a bit more. One question is: so why is it then so difficult for people to forgive? Um, that's one. Secondly, um, can somebody make heaven? Somebody that does not forgive, can that person? make heaven. There is that a question to me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. We're talking about abundant Definitely. life. Abundant from life ends in heaven. From what we've seen in the Bible, the, 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 there is no place for liars, there's no place for murderers and all of that in the Bible, in, the, in, in heaven, rather. So unforgiveness is not... Someone that doesn't forgive, I don't think can make heaven. And okay. if we look at the book of Galatians from the fruits of the, the spirit and the works of the flesh also listed there, I believe hatred is there. Okay. And things close to unforgiveness is there. So the second part, it's about uh, why is it difficult for people to forgive? Okay. The nature of man, God has said it in the Bible, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. So even a little child that is born, for some reason, they tell lies, they, they know what to do when they are just toddlers and all of that. But that is the Adamic nature, the old sinful nature. But if we look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, it talks about us renewing our minds renewing our minds in Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God. So we have to, when we come to Christ and become born again, we lay our hearts down, lay everything. In fact, we die to this sinful nature and we have a new life in Christ Jesus. And it is only that new life through the Spirit of God that can help us. Even when things go wrong, we can turn the other cheek as it were, as Jesus did when we are slapped to him. Thank you very much for that. I think your time is up now. Um, so good point there. So um, uh, unforgiveness, it's grievous. It's one thing that uh, 
will make even those who profess to be Christians not to make it. And for anybody who is struggling with unforgiveness, give your life to Jesus by the Spirit of God, the Spirit grace, you'll be able to forgive and make up your mind to forgive. Just to support her, Matthew chapter 6 is one of the scriptures. I always refer us to this scripture, read it. So we should all make up our minds to forgive and then go give us the grace and the, the spirit to do so. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 is the Lord from verse 9 is the Lord's prayer up to verse 13. That's what we always pray. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, we go up to verse 13, we stop there. But verses 14 and 15 is the real control of the Lord's prayer that we have been praying. Hear what 14 says, verse 14, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Please note it down, because when I asked her, she said, I don't think. It's not I don't think, it's clearly written, spelled out by Jesus Christ. And from the example that uh, you also gave about that uh, the servant that didn't forgive uh, his fellow servant, let's read it. He said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. 15, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Another question is, who and who should we forgive? Only those who did small things against us, the one that did serious things, we should not forgive, no. God said, forgive all. You must forgive all. And the other thing to remember, as I'm taking time on this, because this is one thing that will hinder even people, because we always feel justified. If somebody has done something bad to you, you feel justified not to forgive that person, right? You feel it's your righteous right, right? But God said, Jesus has taught us the key. You must forgive. The other thing that helps you to forgive is to come to the knowledge that when we forgive, God says, vengeance is mine. Don't think that that person is free. <laughs> God will do what he has to do, but you do your part, which is forgive. But let me also tell you another thing. Some of us, out of ignorance, when we forgive, we now go to God and say, oh, God, please forgive that person. That's not your duty. That's not your responsibility. You can do so. It's up to you. But what God wants is for you to forgive the person, hand him over to God. Let God be the one that decides his own forgiveness. Does that now help? <laughs> so, praise God. We're still going to discuss more on this. Sister Gloria, thank you so much for putting the focus on this. I believe when we come back, probably uh, people may have one or two things. So, Brother Sonny is to um, look at who Jesus said he was and what the Bible says he is. Yeah? So, who Jesus says he is, according to the book of Matthew and Mark, and what the scripture in this these two scriptures says Jesus is, so we can know him and relate with him. All right, Sonny, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Pastor, and good yes. afternoon, everyone. I want to start my discussion by reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21. Here the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Here is very clear in the Bible that Jesus Christ is our savior. He is the savior of mankind. He is the savior of the world. And no man can actually be saved if he's not in Jesus Christ. So the Bible is very clear in that particular uh, place I've just read that Jesus is the savior of mankind. And secondly, I have to go straight to uh, the book of uh, Mark that was our study this morning, and that is chapter nine. Chapter nine of the book of Mark, verse uh, seven. There the Bible says, uh, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, 
And the voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Here, this is God confirming the sonship of Jesus as the son of God. So Jesus, not only the savior of the world, he is the son of God. And uh, apart from Mark, Matthew in chapter 3, verse number uh, 17, also talk about that Jesus Christ is the son of God of God. In Matthew yeah, chapter sorry, 3. Sorry, brother Sonny. Brother Sonny, let me intervene here. This was back, basically the study we went through last Sunday. So go ahead. You've told us the Son of God. Can you move to other things that Jesus right. said about himself? Yes. Because so Jesus is the Savior. He is the Savior of the world, Savior of mankind. He is the Son of God. And Jesus also is our healer, as we can see in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 8 from verse 16 uh, to 17. He is our healer. And uh, in all of this, he is the Christ. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. And that therefore means that he is everything to us as those that believe in him. And our life should be built around that. He is our savior. And it is very good that if we have the knowledge of Christ as Christians, this will go a long way in helping us in everyday life that we keep on living in the world. Because if you look at the world around us, even in our offices, in our schools, in our environment, we realize that there are so many different kinds of teachings that are actually not in line with what the word of God is saying. So if we have the knowledge of what Christ is actually is, like actually, I think um, when Jesus asked his disciples what men really think he was, and uh, waiting for the response from them. And I think Peter was the one who told him that he is the son of God, the, the Christ. Christ did not just stop there. He asked them to also tell him what they themselves actually feel he is to them. So I think that is what all of us should also be learning from. We must realize our, uh, the Christ in our own way. There should be a way that we should have uh, an interaction, a personal relationship with Christ in our own personal way, not just what people tell us. We should go as far as knowing Christ the way that we're supposed to know him according to the word of God. Because if we don't do that, based on what we have in the world around us today, we'll actually be deceived. And Christ in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, had actually told us that there is need for us to know him so that we will not be deceived by the so many antichrists and the so many prophets that will come to deceive the world. So Christ Jesus, in summary, is the son of God, is our healer. I think yesterday, let me actually emphasize on the issue of uh, healing a bit because of the short time that we have. Yesterday, I was actually teaching, and uh, you know, among the students, one of the students just shouted heavily, and she ran out of the class. I was still teaching you know, you know, in the class. So after some seconds, I have to walk away from the class. And then as she was just rolling on the ground, shouting, shouting, shouting heavily, and people came around. I said, what would have happened to this girl? I call her, Miriam, what happened to you? She then mentioned that uh, it is our operation place that is actually paining her. So I asked for my phone so that I can call the parents. And my spirit told me, no, you don't call. Just pray for her. I remember what Pastor have been saying, that we have the gift of the healing, that we have children of Christ, that we can do many things. So I have to stop calling the, uh, the parent. And then I prayed over her. As I was praying, I began to see that she was calm. And uh, I asked her after some time, how are you feeling? She said, she's feeling better. And I, was, well, I pray for her, let's say three, four minutes to her. And then uh, she was actually, uh, you know, recovered. And then uh, I, we went back to the class. I thought she would go back. So she was able to stay throughout the three hours that we spent in the class. So these are the things that we are talking about. You know, putting this knowledge of Christ, because if I do not have the knowledge as the son of God, that I have the, the gift of healing through Christ and through what I've been learning, through his revelation and in his word, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So these are the things that I've learned about Christ, what he is to us as Christians. And if we, it is, it is key, you. it's very, very important that we should put it into practice in our daily living. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, excellent. Okay, I think we now move to Sister Comfort. Yeah, okay, just introduce what you're covering and then go ahead because of time. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I think I am looking at um, Mark chapter four, uh, verse 35 to 
41, as well as um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. Is it? Yeah. So we, um, Matthew and Mark, those two chapters said the same thing. But I would like us to read uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, so that we will see exactly what we are talking about. Because um, we want to see what are the challenges of Jesus' disciple. What lesson will we learn from that chapter that we will be reading? So that is why I want us to read it together and see what is in this uh, scripture. So I, I do the reading. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. It says, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the wind, to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obeyed him. Thanks be to God for the reading. Amen. So after that reading, what stood out for me, what I saw in that reading is um, Jesus' miraculous power and authority over the storms and the wave, or I would say nature. And I also see how difficult it is for the disciple of Jesus to remain calm under a trying circumstances. So uh, that helps us to see what we are, the situation that we find ourselves in life. So we can liken the situation that we are today, like the storm. We can see that in the life that we are living, we are facing many challenges. Life today is full of pain, pain from even political uncertainty that we have seen. The hardship that everyone is passing through and the busy kind of life that we have seen, things are so busy that you cannot even explain what is going on. And you can see for that is general thing, but what happened when you are facing a persecution? What happened when you have life-threatening things? So you can see what the disciples did, even though they have that luxury of being there with Christ Jesus physically, even though they have experienced what Christ has done, all the miraculous work that Jesus has done before with, with them, when this storm came, with what did they do? They were swept away. They, you can see they demonstrated that they were afraid. They showed that they were doubting. They showed that they have been abandoned. So with this, 
They were now that Jesus, I, I, I do, don't you care for us? So it, it, they, they, they now lose their confidence and trust in Jesus Christ. So that is the challenges that Christians are facing. This is not only uh, it, it say challenges of following Christ. But these are Christian or Christ disciple who have been working with Jesus, who knows Jesus. But at that particular distance, their faith, because Jesus said what was lacking in them was faith. So it's not only them. We can see this thing back even in the times of prophet. Please permit me, I can talk of uh, David. We know who David is, who he was as a child. His confidence and trust in God makes him to kill, defeat a Kolea in the name of God. But that David in uh, Psalms chapter 13, verse one and two, became afraid and asked why God was forsaking him. We can also talk of Elijah, an ancient prophet, who after killing 450 prophets of Baal, loses confidence in God when his faith was weak by saying his life was not good again, he ran away from Jezebel. So that is what I am saying that the uh, situation in life can make even the true servant of God lose his faith, his confidence in God. So now what will help us to remain, to know that in the boats or in this storm that we are, Christ Jesus is with us. Christ Jesus is there. He, he has the authority, that is what I say, authority and power over the storm. It, is, it needs us to build that strong faith. How strong is our faith? So that when this storm comes, we know Christ is with us. Christ, even though he, he was sleeping, we know what the Bible say in Psalms 121, verse four, God does not sleep, he does not slumber. The same, even though Christ was as if he was sleeping. Faith will mean Christ, our leader, our miracle worker, the storm is here. And Christ did demonstrate to them. He has power, he has authority. He woke up, he said, peace, be still. So that is what Christ wants us to do. Christ is, was demonstrating to us at any time, remember I am in the boat with you. Call on me, don't relent. That is also First Peter chapter five, verse seven. Say we should cast all our anxiety on the Lord because he cares for us. So that is one challenge, what we should do. Look up to Jesus at any time. He is in the boat with you. Call on him, he will answer you. Then point two. Never ever lack words of the scripture. Jesus asked them, you don't you have faith? Do you still not have faith? So let your faith move you to call on God, go to the scripture, read the Bible. Hebrews, uh, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 7 says what? We should not rely on our own understanding in every situation. We should acknowledge him. He will guide us. He will make our path straight. He will quench the storm for us. Jesus also called, said that in Matthew and Luke, even, yeah, that come to me, bring your load, bring all your anxiety. I am going to quench it for you. Then another thing, hey. prayer, never doubt. Pray consistently. Jesus encouraged us to pray at all times. So that- want to, want to wrap it up here. Okay. So, so take, uh, um, take 30 seconds and round off, please. 
So what I will say to round it up is, we can be still, we can have peace in the midst of storm if we focus on Jesus Christ. Thank then, you. No matter the challenges too, no matter the fear and anxiety, also may we not forget that Jesus is with us. He will guide us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Comfort. God bless you. Please, does anyone have any other thing to contribute to any of these topics before we pray and round off? Yeah, um, not a particular topic, they say, but um, generally, I want to say that it's been a, a good effort by our brothers and sister that we should keep it up in looking at the teaching and reading the scripture because that is the only way we will build this our faith our most holy faith in Christ Jesus yes and, and, apply, and applying it to our lives doing thank it engaging it thank you yeah. Okay, the thing I want to add then, if there is nobody else who wants to say something, it's uh, on this facing challenges. So, Sister Comfort, thank you very much. Um, I think just to re-echo what she said, the fact that you are a Christian does not mean you will not face life challenges. Everybody faces challenges in life. So there are challenges. I think that's the first thing to remember. And there may be some challenges that even comes to you additionally because of your faith, because of who you are. But let's even just put it down to the challenges of life. So there are challenges in life. Um, and so in those situations, she has enumerated what we do to handle those challenges in life. She's mentioned we should put our faith and trust in Jesus. We should call on him, which is prayer, praying consistently. And we should, you know, study the word of God to know God's provision and stand by it. And of course, it's the word of God that builds our faith. The addition I want to remind us of is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a specialist in helping us even in troubled times. We must learn to develop a personal consciousness and relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit so we can enjoy his comfort in the times of trouble. In fact, if I were to tell us why we use this statement, this story here to make this analogy, the difference between us today and these disciples who were in this situation is the Holy Spirit. By this time, they didn't have the Holy Spirit, but of course, Jesus was physically with them, just like Sister Comfort um, brought out that key point. But it doesn't matter if there is nothing inside that makes them bold. The Spirit of God is the one who makes us bold. The Bible says the righteous is as bold as a lion. And he said, we have received the spirit that uh, is not the spirit of fear anymore, but the spirit of love, the spirit of power and of sound mind. So the Holy Spirit is critical in helping us through every storm of life. He is the comforter and may he comfort us. Be with us, teach us, and guide us through in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, I would always remind us that it is the doers, not the hearers. This is not uh, entertainment at all. And this is about life. We're talking about abundant life. Like Brother Dara kept emphasizing. He said, Jesus Christ has given us a template to live a successful life. He has given us a template. So I want to challenge you, go and begin to define this template 
And don't just keep it at the general level. Go very specific. What is this template of life, template of living? If you live by it, you will have a successful life. This is the abundant life, brothers and sisters. So get to know what Jesus has done. Get to know who he is. Get to know what he has done. Get to know what he says we should do and do just that. Calling on him and you will enjoy life. Let us pray. If you have not given your life to Jesus, this is the time to tell him, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And if you're also not confident that the Holy Spirit has been given to you, this is the time to also say, Father, I repent of my sins and now I ask, forgive me. And tell him, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, give me your Holy Spirit. And I believe God, he will give, he will give his spirit to you now. So go ahead and pray that prayer. Go ahead and pray that prayer. Pray with me, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Almighty God, I thank you for giving me your only begotten son to save my life, to save me. Now, Lord, I repent of my sins. I forsake them all and I ask, Lord, forgive me my sins and save me now in Jesus' name. Pray now and say, Heavenly Father, please give me your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. I receive that the Holy Spirit of God. And I surrender myself to you, Holy Spirit, transform my life. The comforter, my te the teacher, teach me the way of God and cause me from today to live according to the will of God for my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let us agree. Every storm of life that we are facing, oh, by the strength of the Holy Spirit and the power of God in the name of Jesus, we shall all overcome. Let us pray. Let that storm come to an end now. Let that storm come to an end. Like Jesus said, peace be still. We want to pray that prayer together. Peace be still. Go ahead and pray with me. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have taught us. And we stand in agreement. And we say whatever storm of life there may be in our indiv individual lives and our lives collectively as a family, in our families, in our spouses, in our children, in our business, in our careers, in our ministries, we speak to that storm right now. In the name of Jesus, you storm, peace be still, cease. You raging wave, peace be still, cease. In the name of Jesus, Almighty God, let your peace envelop our lives. Thank you, our Lord and our King. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. This is where we close. The Almighty God bless you and have a pleasant week. Bye-bye.